be speaking to all me today about some of my research over the past 10 years into the uh, Assyrian persecutions and massacres during the First World War and thereafter and the evolution of the modern nation state in that context. So I've given a title of Unremembering the Ottoman Assyrians and Greeks, Historical Errors and Threats of Repetition. And the threats of repetition are not so much uh, that the historical errors will be repeated, but the actual events will be evoked or repeated in some, uh, some of the nation states that used to make up the Ottoman Empire uh, or its territory. So uh, I'm going to start with, uh, there's some ongoing uncertainty or perhaps even confusion regarding what happened in the World War I uh, anti-Christian persecutions, oftentimes called the Armenian Genocide. Um, you know, David Gaunt, you may have written the most extended analysis of this from the, the Eastern Anatolian or Assyrian perspective, says, uh, we don't really know why this happened. Uh, there's some ambiguity. We need to look in, into more prime ministerial and military archives to understand why this policy uh, evolved or whether it even was a policy, whether local commanders were on road missions, or uh, what exactly the intention was to assess uh, genocidal intent or the lack thereof. Uh, another aspect of, of uncertainty is uh, whether the genocide was reciprocal. So, Uber Umit uh, argued uh, in 2014 the genocide was reciprocal and affected the Kurds and the Balkan uh, Turks and Muslims as much as the Assyrians or the Ottoman Greeks. Uh, so, was it reciprocal? Was it simply a zone of extreme violence or a, a zone of genocide, a, a shatter zone, one book has it, or a blood lake, another book has it? That's a question. Uh, a third uh, question is uh, whether there was a uh, whether there are any theories or any evidence of a policy of the Turkification of all Christians and what that means. So Tanner Akshan has you know probably written uh, the most about the internal thinking and, and evolution of the, of the policy of massacre or, or of tolerating massacre in the late Ottoman Empire. And he basically says, well, the genocide started after the, the Second Balkan War and the, the losses of territory and the threat of a Russian invasion with Armenian volunteers and maybe uh, a Syrian uprising and a Greek landing. So it was sort of uh, implemented ad hoc. And there, were, there was a second layer of the need to resettle people fleeing from the Balkans or from Albania and other places or from the Caucasus, uh, the Circassians. And so there were these two elements of a, of a retaliatory or a preemptive strike against possible insurgency, and secondly, the uh, resettlement and incorporation of these refugee communities who were victimized by uh, the, the European Christian powers and by Russia. So this, these questions may lead to uh, a denial or a, a hesitancy to recognize or, or discuss the Assyrian and Greek experience during the Armenian Genocide. The, the Armenian case could be more clear. Uh, there were uh, larger numbers of Armenian victims, it is believed. There was a total genocide, some would argue, in the Armenian case. Uh, but we don't know what happened in the Assyrian case or the, or the Greek case. Or if we do know what happened, it was so sporadic or so reciprocal with the Kurds that we can't call it a genocide. We might call it a, a zone of violence or, or a struggle of some kind or conflict. Uh, the second uh, aspect of this are statistical questions. You know, Israel Charney has written a, a uh, article uh, about why do scholars deny genocide, and he says there are four basic reasons, maybe five. But the first is we just don't know what happened. We have to do more research. Secondly, there are statistical questions or games. Uh, so you, you deflate the number of people that were living in the territory pre-genocide, you inflate the number of survivors, and you say, well, it wasn't that bad. That's, that's often the, the strategy of, of books published by the various strategic su study centers of the Turkish government uh, in Ankara and elsewhere, uh, the, the Turkish Histor Historical Society, other its adjuncts. Um, then you have the problem of definitionalism. So uh, some scholars would say, well, genocide has to be total, or at least a total intention. And other episodes, conflict, persecution, tragedy, uh, those can be sporadic, partial, ambiguous, reciprocal. So if, if you don't fit in that definition of total genocide, root and branch, some people call it, then it's not a genocide, or it's, it's, it's merely a conflict. Uh, and the fourth is, is just raw power politics, real politik. It will be bad for our present day economic and military interests to say this or that, therefore let's not say it. 
uh, or it would be bad for us as scholars to alienate our, our fellow scholars or our fellow citizens by, by speaking in certain ways about what happened. So let's do it in a degree of order. Uh, the unremembered genocide is, is how the Armenian genocide uh, began to be discussed in, in the 70s and, and, and 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, the notion was, well, everybody remembered the Holocaust. There are movies. There are uh, museums. There are uh, episodes in the United Nations where, uh, you know, during the founding of the State of Israel or during the drafting of the Genocide Convention or during the drafting of human rights documents, people talk about the you know, unacceptable, never again aspect of the Holocaust. We, we can't allow that to happen again. We must remember so we don't repeat. Whereas the Armenian genocide was forgotten, and therefore uh, we need to excavate it with scholarship. And you, you, you see this uh, the beginning of Armenian studies as, as a possible discipline on its own, separate from the study of Turkey or the study of the Levant or the study of. Asia in general, you have Armenian studies focused to some extent on the, on the genocide period. And the notion of the Armenian genocide that emerges is it began in 1915 with a sudden spasm of activity and, and targeted 1.2 million out of 2 million Armenians who were then killed. And frequently there is no mention of other Christians being targeted or, or dying or what the number was. Uh, and some uncertainty about whether there even were other communities in the area. Sometimes it, it completely is not mentioned that there were other people living side by side with Armenians uh, in eastern Anatolia or other parts of Anatolia called the Syrians or Greeks or Syriacs or, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, another interesting development in this, in this trend was the, the permanent People's Tribunal on the Armenian Genocide. The People's Tribunal, you may recall, they had one for the Vietnam War, the Russell Tribunal, they had one for the Armenian Genocide. More recently, they've had one for Sri Lanka. They might have one for Myanmar and Burma. Uh, it's sort of a, we can't get a real tribunal, so let's have a people's tribunal of scholars and, and activists to, to remember this thing. And, and, then, and once again, the, the story was there were 1.2 million Armenians killed. Uh, the young Turk government was to blame. And it was all during the war. It was a 1915 to 1917 episode. And we don't really need to talk about the 19th century or or the 20s or 30s, uh, it was a discrete period of time that this intention developed and uh, affected 1.2 million Armenians, or at least affected them to the point of death. Uh, scholarship, for example, by Robert Nelson um, expanded on this theory, comparing it to the Holocaust increasingly during the 90s, uh, treating the Armenian experience as the first modern genocide you often hear, uh, comparable in its total intention and in its, its modernizing implementation to the Holocaust, not as mechanized, not as, uh, you could say, banal in, in Hannah Arendt's term, it's sort of uh, camp-like structure at the use of trains and so forth, but still a uh, required mobilizing the resources of a, of a relatively advanced nation state with modern weapons to target a particular group on ideological grounds in a revolutionary period and uh, Exterminate. So there's a parallel there. And other groups not mentioned, maybe they don't fit the narrative, uh, maybe there was some uncertainty about their existence at the time. Uh, so this analysis is becoming more, even more academic than, let's say, a permanent people's tribunal or an article in a magazine like uh, Ms. Hasebian's article in Commentary. Uh, another uh, prominent book is, is Jay Winter's America and the Armenian Genocide, 1915 calling the first genocide of the 20th century as, as the one that occurred in Turkish Armenia and affected one million people. Uh, so now Armenia is a place within Turkey where uh, one million people were killed, and uh, there's very little reference to or uh, acknowledgement of the other people in the region or, or whether that even was called Armenia as, as a distinct place at the time. So if we look back at the original source documents, what do we learn? I, I think we learn something different than this narrative, or, or something broader, or, and also more, in some ways simpler, in some ways more complex. And I'll go through the traditional journalism, who, what, why, where, and how. So who is it that's doing these, this, uh, this persecution or, or policy of massacre? Uh, the German ambassador says that the Turkish government, especially the Minister of the Inter Interior, uh, decided for reasons that were unrelated to military effectiveness uh, to start killing the Christian people, especially the Armenians. Um, he 
he was not necessarily like Russia or Britain fighting the Ottoman Empire, needing to de discredit it or delegitimize it. He is on their side. And that's what he's saying in his documents uh, among his, uh, his compatriots, uh, the German diplomatic and ambassadorial uh, staff. Similarly, the American ambassador says that Turkish soldiers, gendarmes, and peasants uh, working with Kurdish tribes and other brigands and gangs uh, were committing this violence. So he, he paints kind of a broad brush as he was participating. Um, similarly, the US consul in Aleppo reporting up to the ambassador says Turkish soldiers and Kurds were the ones to, to blame. Uh, there are other you know, reports in Armenian journalistic sources and so forth. There were something called butcher battalions and regular soldiers working together, almost like during World War II, you had the Wehrmacht and the Einsatzgruppen, uh, you had the, the, the military and the, uh, the sort of killing death squads uh, working together at the same time. In, in the Ottoman context, they call those butcher battalions. Uh, what happened then? We know who the actors were, but what did they do? Uh, there is a quote attributed to Mustafa Kemal, and sometimes it's debated, but it's quoted in saying this, that millions of our Christian subjects were ruthlessly driven from their homes and massacred. So no longer just one million, but millions. Similarly, Ambassador Morgenthau said there was a devilish scheme to annihilate the Armenian, Greek, and Syrian Christians in Turkey. Uh, and at one point he talks about two million. Uh, the British ambassador to the United States, Sir James Bryce, uh, refers in the preface to a book published in 1920 to the Nestorian and Assyro-Chaldean churches equally being the victims of the plan for exterminating Christianity, root and branch, uh, in the Eastern Empire. The German humanitarian leader, uh, Johannes Lepsius, talked about the extermination of the Christian element in Turkey without differentiation as to their race or denomination. So not simply the Armenian race or the Armenian Orthodox denomination, uh, but the entire Christian religious community, the element. Uh, Similarly, a Catholic priest from Diyarbakir, who wrote a book, um, said that the Turkish military and police were rounding up brutally anyone whom they found on the streets of, of the Diyarbakir region, uh, lashing them, and then cutting their throats. Uh, similarly, the German ambassador wrote of a systematic extermination in Diyarbakir, uh, and the motive or the, the plan was to kill or expel everything that is not Turkish. So pan-Turkism or, or uh, hostility to the non-Turkish element. Although, if you go back to the other quotations, it seems like there was an, an exclusion of Kurds from this anti-non-Turkish policy. Uh, so you could question whether it was actually a pro-Turkish policy or an anti-Christian policy that would therefore not include the Kurds. Uh, the German consul in Mosul wrote, and he was receiving reports from a variety of places, that undoubtedly Christians uh, are outlawed, Brabant. So there was a genuine persecution of the Christians in Mardin and Ahmadi. Uh, the German consul in Aleppo said that the Christians of Sirte and Jazera were exterminated. The uh, German consul in Erzurum said that the Assyrians of Hakari were annihilated, in part at least, and the rest of Aleppo. Uh, the Ottoman Ministry of the Interior had some documentary traffic about this episode. Uh, that was collected at the Mesopotamian Archive of Sertetur University of Sweden, and it said that the Nestorians had a predisposition to be influenced by foreigners, therefore there was a reference to their deportation and expulsion from their locations in the border area with Iran, and the government will not undertake to provide any type of support to them. So deportation and then deprivation of food and, and uh, housing at, at the place of their uh, deportation. Sometimes it's called the interior, the place they're being deported to, uh, inside of Turkey. Although the people were, were kicked out of the Ottoman Empire, so there was also exterior. Uh, the U.S. Presbyterian uh, mission to Persia talked about the border region inhabited by Assyrians, Murgavar, Turgavar, and Daesh being destroyed even before the war began. Uh, so the plains between the Ottoman Empire and Turkey, the communities that were destroyed even before the war began. So rather than, than there being an uprising and fighting, there was a uh, targeting of civilian, civilian communities preemptively even before the war began, according to him. Uh, continuing on, the, the, the honorary vice consul for the United States in Hermia, Persia said that what happened was the robbing and killing uh, of the men and women and the outraging of the women. Uh, a 
U.S. missionary in that same area said that the Armenians and Syrians in the region of Bashkala had been massacred. The Iranian foreign minister even wrote of violence that is most noted in the areas where there are many villages inhabited by Christians where the population has been violated and mercilessly massacred. Raphael Lemkin wrote a dossier on the Armenian genocide, was published in 2008 in California. He talked about it as a holocaust. He mentions the Assyrians, or the Nestorian Assyrians. He says that the other Christians were massacred by Kurds in the Syrian desert, and that in northwestern Persia, hundreds of Christians were killed and their children were stolen by the Kurds. Uh, where did this happen? So we talked about some of these regions, um, Mardin, uh, Diyarbakir, uh, Hakkari, uh, the Ottoman uh, Persian border region over here, Ermia, uh, Ahmadiyya, the, what is today the Turkish uh, Iraqi border almost. Uh, so this whole area, and I have another uh, circling of the cities, Ermia, Julemur, or Hakkari, Harput, Yarkir, uh, Urfa, uh, or Edessa, Mardin, uh, Nisibin and Bitlis are, are all mentioned in, in, in some, of, some or all of these documents. Uh, this is the map that was published by the, the British on their report on these atrocities, and it just highlights some of these same locations, and I've just drawn a box around to, uh, to illustrate. Why did this happen? Well, the, the Ottoman interior minister was quoted as saying that he was intent on taking advantage of the World War in order to make a clean sweep of the internal enemies the indigenous Christians. Taking advantage of, not responding to, exploiting, is, is one quotation. Uh, Ambassador Morgenthau, he, he, he quotes this, this uh, <coughs> expression, and he says that the passion for turpifying the nation seemed to demand logically the extermination of all Christians, not simply the Armenians. Uh, the U.S. Consul in Aleppo said that actually the other motive was, was stealing. It was a gigantic plundering scheme as well as an effort <coughs> to extinguish the Armenian race. Uh, Paul Shimon, writing on behalf of the Assyrian Patriarch in this book published by the British, said that first they killed the women, then they first they killed the men, then they took the women who had not escaped and carried them off, and finally they plundered and burned the villages, evoking what uh, the U.S. consul said. Um, in the German diplomatic traffic, they refer to the Assyrian and Chaldean massacres in Ahmadiyya, Jazeera, Jarabakir, Mardin, Midyat, Urfa, and northern Persia, echoing what the Americans and the British are saying, as well as you can look at what the French and Russians were saying, that they have similar expressions. The Times of, of London, probably the most prominent newspaper at that time, said that 250,000 Assyrian and Chaldeans uh, died from persecutions and famine as of 1919. There were bloody massacres and tragic deportations, and the cause of all of them was fanaticism. That was the, the time for uh, As I said, Joseph Nye wrote this book about it. He said that uh, there were complete massacres of the Christians in Bitlis and Sir, and they never failed to kill any unfortunate child or woman who left the refugee lines uh, on, on route to Persia from Tagar. Lyman von Sanders to be tried was the, the headline in 1919. He was ordered to take his trial for ordering the massacres of Armenians and Syrians during the war. The, the high officials for the occupation of Constantinople ordered this trial. Uh, apparently it didn't go forward, but there was a, uh, the, the order for the trial to happen was reported. Uh, this is just another uh, reference to the same thing dated February 1920, along with the other trials, uh, mostly for crimes against British prisoners and other Allied prisoners. Uh, Raphael Lemkin, as I noted, said that uh, the Armenians and the Assyrian persecution in 1933 were examples of what he called genocide. Uh, he referred to genocide as a denationalization process, removing a nation from a certain region for whatever ideological or, or political reason. Uh, and he didn't see any problem with using the term genocide for offensive back to character. Gabriel Yonan wrote a, a book that, that brought many of these events back to attention, gathering a lot of the German documents, a lot of the English and Russian documents, and saying that the German documentary uh, reports and diplomatic reports supported a widespread campaign against the Assyrians in both the Persian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, by both troops and Kurds. The German diplomatic uh, documents have now been translated and published by Wolfgang Gust uh, with the, the Zorian Institute in Toronto, and uh, you can read all those in, in English now, since 2013, uh, the German Foreign Office Archive reports. 
D.A. Halo also brought people's attention back to this, saying that the, uh, her family, which was a, a mixture of Assyrian and, and Greek, uh, suffered from these deportations, uh, and that they were threatened with the loss even of their names by having to flee to other countries and adopt other identities because their homeland was basically destroyed or rendered uh, unwelcoming to them. What about the statistics? I mean, there are still questions about the statistics. Were, were the Armenians uh, greater uh, or worse affected in terms of a proportion, in terms of absolute numbers? Uh, certainly in terms of absolute numbers, the Armenians were worse affected than the Assyrians. Um, there are a number of uh, books and articles sort of trending towards a figure of, if you add up all of the Armenian, Greek, and Assyrian victims, you get two to three million. And it, it may depend whether you think that the Armenian count was 1 million or 1.5 million. If you take it into 1918 and 1920, the Hakkadejian others would, would say it's 1.5 million. Uh, then the Greek toll, it depends on what you believe the original population of the Ottoman Greeks was. If you believe it was 3 or 4 million, and then there were 1.2 million uh, that, that went to Greece, and maybe 50,000 left in Turkey, then you get a toll of you know 1.8 million. If you believe there were 2 million, then the toll of the Greeks was 800,000. If you believe in an even smaller Greek population, you get a different number. But anyway, you get hundreds of thousands of Greeks. And then the Syrians, you, uh, it depends on whether you look at the, the Russian estimates, or the British estimates, or the, or the Turkish estimates. The Ottoman estimates, when there was a strange thing that happened to them, they went from uh, a figure of 230,000 in 1844, Syrians and, and Chaldeans, Kaldani, to like less than 100,000 in, in, towards the later censuses. And that's what the, the books published by the Turkish Historical Society, they use that to say, well, there couldn't have been more than 100,000 victims. Uh, the British said that there were about uh, 600 or 700,000 in both Ottoman Empire and Persia, or more like 400,000 in the Ottoman Empire uh, as of the late 19th, early 20th century. So then if you, if you say that a certain tens of thousands went to Persia, tens of thousands more went to Russia, and there were tens of thousands up in Turkey, you would get maybe 250,000, 300,000 victims in the Ottoman Empire and, and Persia added together. Uh, there's another book called Jim German that, that goes through a lot of this, edited by Tessa Hoffman. So you get a, uh, a proportional reduction of the Armenian population that is greater if you assume that there were originally 1.5 million in, in what is now Turkey and it declined to 250,000, whereas the Assyrian declined from maybe almost 400,000 to uh, 50 to 70,000, uh, but the Assyrians were actually left with fewer people. There were actually more Armenians left in Turkey at the end of the war than there were Assyrians remaining. So to say that it was a total genocide and there were more people left than the people you say that it was a partial genocide, that's a bit of an odd argument, although you can support it with the notion that a greater proportion were killed. Looking at Turkey today, the numbers are, uh, the Armenian Orthodox are larger than the Jews, Syrian Orthodox, Yazidis, Chaldeans, Assyrians, and uh, others combined. So more than 65,000 Armenians, uh, and there are even more immigrants from Armenia itself into Turkey. Uh, but, you know, fewer than 20,000 Assyrians and, and Chaldeans and, and Syriacs. The Jews were a greater proportion of the German population in 2006 than the Assyrians or Greeks are of the Turkish population in 2006. Uh, so the, the Greeks are less than, you know, uh, less than one hundredth of the percent of the Turkish population, and the Assyrians are um, less than a tenth of a percent of the Turkish population. Whereas originally, Christianity was about a quarter of Turkey as the population, uh, which I don't think Jews ever reached that proportion in, in Germany. Uh, and with respect to the Kurds suffering a reciprocal genocide by the Assyrians or the Armenians or whoever, uh, Kurds were about 17% of the Turkish population. So uh, the number of Kurds increased from you know, 1 million to, to 7 million, and later to even more. So if the Christian population had increased like the Kurdish population, there would be something like 24 million Christians in Turkey today, whereas in fact there are less than 300,000. Uh, in Persia, the Assyrian population was actually reduced more than the Armenian population. Uh, 
Uh, the Armenian population actually increased from the mid-19th to the mid-20th century. The Assyrian population declined by almost 90% from the mid-19th to the mid-20th century, uh, according to uh, Abraham. What about the definition of genocide applying it to all of these events? Well, you, you do have the definitional question of a total genocide. You may have read recently the trial of Rana Karadzic and the question of whether Srebrenica was a genocide and whether it, it was, whether all of Bosnian Muslims, their fate was a genocide. That's what the prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia said, that the Bosnian Muslims as a whole suffered a genocide, not just Srebrenica. And that's what Turkey argued in 1992 when, you know, less than 1% of the, of the Bosnian Muslims had been killed, Turkey called that a genocide in a draft resolution. Um, let alone a third of that, to two thirds, like the Amer Armenians and Assyrians. Um, so what does the definition have to say? The definition says at all periods of history, genocide has occurred. That's important, because it goes back before 1948. Genocide didn't start in 1948. It has occurred at all periods of history. Part two, it is certain acts committed with the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. So it says partial in the definition. Partial is included in the definition. And it includes all these acts that we've been talking about, killing, abusing, or torturing, inflicting poor conditions of life through deportation or camp life, preventing births, and forcibly transferring children from one group to another. You read about the orphanages. There's a movie about the Armenian orphans and their, their turbification and so forth. Their children were not brought up as Armenians and Assyrians as their parents had intended. They were orphans. Traditional interpretation of the Genocide Convention has, has been very broad. They say that you can infer the genocidal intent from the acts. You don't need a smoking gun document that says, yes, I intended to kill all the Tutsis of Rwanda. Yes, I wanted to kill all the Bosnians. Instead, they say, if the intention was to create a greater Serbia, and the Bosnians had to either die in the war or be deported or submit to the Serbian rule, that's also a genocide. And you infer it from all the violent acts against the Bosnian Muslims or against the Tutsis in the case of Rwanda or against the Darfurians in the case of Sudan. Uh, so you, you use the acts to define the intent rather than saying, well, acts are just war crimes and intent has to be a total genocide. In fact, the acts and the intent are merged in the jurisprudence. So the International Association of Genocide Scholars has said that the scope of genocide extends to the, the plight of the Assyrians, Pontian, and Anatolian Greeks during and after World War I. They were killed on an equivalent scale and by many of the same methods, including executions, death marches, and starvation. Uh, I wrote in 2011 that the Turkish government has condemned smaller and more limited massacres of Muslims in former Ottoman and other domains as genocide, including in Cyprus in the 1970s, necessitating the Turkish invasion and partition of Cyprus, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, necessitating Turkey to send arms to the rebellion in Yugoslavia, in Kosovo, same deal, and in, even in China, uh, Turkestan, China, uh, Turkey has said there's a genocide against the Turkish population because of rioting and strife, and in Palestine. Uh, they, they repeatedly say there's a genocide in Palestine. The temporal aspect. What, what about the non-retroactivity of the Genocide Convention, which is a major <coughs> sticking point for, for example, the British Parliament and, and a lot of scholars? Uh, there's something called the Convention on the Non-Applicability of Statutory Limitations to, the, uh, to Crimes Against Humanity. And it says that none of the statutes and conventions about genocide have a, have a statute of limitation. Uh, and the, the application of the statute of limitations for some kind of expiration date on a genocide is contrary to world public opinion because it prevents punishment and that outrageous conscience. The, the Nuremberg Tribunal consistently rejected the argument of ex post facto law, which is to say you drafted a new law to make a crime, something that wasn't a crime when I did it. They rejected it. They said murder was already a crime. The fact that we're calling it a genocide doesn't matter. It's just big time murder. Uh, the, uh, in the, the World Court and the United States Courts and the Supreme Court of Israel have all said that uh, the Genocide Convention merely confirms a customary international law norm against genocide that predated it, that matured sometime in the, in the 19th or 20th century uh, under the rubric of crimes against humanity or, or extermination or massacre or something like that. Then you get to the political dimension. So the United States has kind of flip-flopped on genocide. Originally, they told the World Court in 1951 that the Armenian example was exemplary of genocide. In 2015, President Obama and Congress did not want to pass an Armenian genocide resolution like other countries did. 
Britain has taken that position too. Uh, Winston Churchill said that the, you know, the Armenian experience was like a major holocaust and, and a new crime that we haven't seen before, not like a regular war crime. But David Cameron doesn't want to say it's a genocide uh, for various economic and military reasons, his opponents say. Uh, the Greek parliament has said that there was a genocide of, of, the, uh, of the Greeks. The European parliament referred in a resolution of 2006 on Turkish accession to the need to, to treat the Assyrian and Greek genocide like the Armenian genocide, to recognize it, to open up the archives, and to stop criminalizing its, its study and expression uh, under Article 301 or the other parts of the Turkish Penal Code. The Swedish parliament included the Assyrians and the Greeks in a, in a genocide resolution back in 2010, and Armenia and Greece have, have new resolutions from last year, uh, as well as, I believe, perhaps Russia. Uh, on the other hand, Turkey has a different policy. They have monuments to Anwar and Talat Pasha, um, commemorating their heroism and liberation of the empire and so forth. Uh, they had a state ceremony in 1996 to, to rebury Anwar Pasha, uh, and Talat Pasha was already there on the Priya the Ibidia Hill, um, sort of a place of honor for the young Turk leaders. Then the Turkish Historical Society exonerates and praises the young Turk leaders by saying that the Western missionaries had come in it created a nationalist sentiment and then led to uh, uprisings, which caused massacres of the Turkish population and the Kurdish population by the Christians. And then some mistakes were made in response to all that, and that led to 200,000 people dying of hunger or disease and under so similar circumstances to uh, Turks and Kurds dying. But even despite all that, there were more than 900,000 Armenian survivors, according to the Armenian sources. So that's the, the Turkish Historical Society type narrative. Uh, Coming closer to the present, is there a threat of repetition? There was an article in the, New York, in the Los Angeles Times last year saying, for Syrian Armenians, their exodus evokes the flight from genocide a century ago. So 2015 is becoming like 1915 for some Syrian Armenians. Why is that? The former US ambassador to Turkey has said that Turkish government cooperated with Al-Qaeda in Syria, causing exodus of the Christian population. Why did that happen? It allowed its borders to be used as a conduit for eight weapons and volunteers heading for the Syrian rebel cause at the start of the uprising and did not distinguish clearly between moderate groups and extremists. So you see a variety of headlines in the Daily Telegraph going back to 2013 uh, on that topic. Today's Zaman, back in 2014, the Republican People's Party uh, deputy chairman said that weapons were being sent to the uh, extremists in Syria, leading to a danger of, he didn't say this, but I would infer that it leads to a danger of repetition of, of what happened in 1915. <clears throat> the co-founder of the AKP party, Justin Tabella Party, has criticized the government for not doing enough to prevent al-Qaeda getting weapons in Syria. What happened as, a, as partially as a result of all this? The Human Rights Council had a special session on Iraq in 2014, they said that Christian, Yazidi, Turkmen, Shabak, Kakai, Sabian, and Shia communities have been targeted for particularly brutal persecution, which may amount to ethnic and religious cleansing. The General Assembly has said that ethnic cleansing is a form of genocide. So there's a danger of a new genocide in Iraq, is what the Human Rights Council and the UN are saying. They said many people have been killed directly. Others have been deprived of food, water, or medication. Scores are dying of exhaustion and privation due to displacement. There is slavery, sexual and physical abuse and torture, while shrines, churches, and other religious sites are being destroyed. So a lot of the things that happened in 2015 in terms of the acts are being repeated. Is the intention the same? Maybe not, but the acts are certainly there. Uh, seven churches are being destroyed per year in Syria, one estimate said. Uh, there was an article back in 2012, we left homes because they were trying to kill us, the Christians said, from homes uh, where the Syrian Orthodox used to be headquartered. Uh, Kassab was attacked from the Turkish direction. The Armenians from Kassab said they said they had to flee back in 2014. Uh, there was a report uh, that extremist financiers, mainly from the Persian Gulf, are camped out in hotels along the southeastern Turkish frontier, meeting with jihadist groups. That creates a danger of repetition. Turkey is not banning ISIS web recruitment websites the same way they ban Kurdish radical websites. There was a report in the newspaper that said that. ISIS extremists are closely linked and working with Turkish crime rep networks in Gaziantep or Akkali, sorry, um, to uh, do things like trading oil and antiquities. There are reports by terrorist experts about that. And 
ISIS is selling Assyrian antiquities from Mosul in the museum through Turkey, the reports are saying. What about Turkey's international role? You know, some people have argued that there is a block within the UN that does not want to recognize a danger of repetition of events like 1915 because they're focused on their co-religionists and their allies in the region. That the UN works upon regional allies, kind of like NATO, and there's a similar regional alliance in the Middle East that would like to downplay the, the danger of Christian persecution today. So Israel, for example, has drawn as many UN human rights resolutions condemning it as all other states combined, <coughs> yeah, including Iraq and the Anfal campaign, including Sudan, including Iran, including, add them all up, less than Israel in terms of condemnations. Uh, the Darfur conflict was relatively neglected, and there's been little con cooperation with the ICC, according to Rosa Friedman's study of the Human Rights Council. Security Council resolutions, 23% uh, of them since 1990 have dealt with Israel and its actions. There are five resolutions referring to a massacre of the Palestinians. The only revolu resolution in the history of the Security Council referring to a criminal massacre was about Israel, rather than Iraq, Sudan, Indonesia, Pakistan, other places. Uh, Israel has repeatedly warned about its actions, they use the term warning, whereas Iraq has never received an official warning about the anti kurdish massacres of the Amphal campaign. There have been weak responses to persecution in the Middle East. So there was no resolution in the Security Council condemning aggression, genocide, and terrorism in Iraq and Syria until very late in the game. Russia had a resolution, it, it didn't go forward. There has been a failure of Turkey to arrest terror leaders on its territory or to disrupt their plans. There's the failure of Iraq to defend its territory while it's disarming local communities in, in critical periods like the summer of 2014. There's the failure of the US and UK to stop the uh, Islamic State of Iraq from invading Syria and then going back into Iraq to conquer Mosul and the Nineveh Plains. And there are scholars have talked about an unserious humanitarian intervention since 2014. If you compare it to the Yugoslav or the Kosovo or the other interventions or the Iraq War of 2013, in terms of money spent, number of airstrikes, territory conquered, uh, it's not serious. Uh, you know, Saddam was routed from his capital in a relatively short period of time. Gaddafi routed from his capital in a short period of time. Uh, Yugoslavia forced to come to the table and surrender in a short period of time. This war is dragging on, is what uh, scholars are saying. Uh, towards further crimes in the next couple of years, uh, what do I see on the horizon? There's a danger, uh, it's been reported in the press, of ceasefires in Syria, giving Al-Qaeda time to regroup and mount new offensives on Aleppo and Damascus. There is talk about the partition of Syria into a so-called no-fly zone occupied by Turkish troops, and there's a danger that the uh, army of Islam and the army of conquest and the Nusra Front could have bases there. There's the growth of PYG bases in Assyrian towns, possibly displacing the population and leading to the destruction of those towns in the crossfire. And there's the continued decline in the life expectancy, liter literacy, and child survival rates in Syria and Nineveh province of Iraq. So uh, that is what the attention of the UN could focus on if they're interested in avoiding a repetition of 1915 in the coming years. Uh, thank you for your time.